The hypocrites agitating for a boycott of the Winter Olympics in China are the same people currently frenzying online and on BBC Radio, because I just heard them, about the Grand Prix in Saudi Arabia. That's a country that cuts people's heads off on a Friday afternoon in the street, in public. It's a country that crucifies teenage boys. Yes, crucifies teenage boys. It's a country whose effective ruler not only murdered Jamal Khashoggi, the columnist on the Washington Post newspaper, but cut him into tiny pieces with a bone saw brought for the purpose and a bone saw air brought in for the purpose and flushed those pieces down the drains of Istanbul. This is a country where there has never been an election of any kind. This is a country to whom we sell deadly weapons so they can massacre people next door in the poorest country in the Arab world, namely in Yemen. This is a country where human rights simply don't exist, where women's rights simply don't exist. But the entire Grand Prix fraternity are all there having a will of a time, ignoring the blood on the tracks. But the hypocrites are not just guilty of double standards when it comes to sporting occasions. The hypocrites are much more dangerous than that. The hypocrites are planning a war. The only question is where? Where do I start? Let me start in Iran, where last night uh, the Iranian peaceful nuclear reactor declared peaceful by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, which has testified time without number that Iran does not have a nuclear bomb, is not seeking to build a nuclear bomb, was itself bombed. Now, the Iranians are playing it down because if they didn't play it down, they'd have to respond. And then I'd be speaking to you already in the middle of a Middle East war. It would already have broken out. Because, of course, the Iranian peaceful nuclear reactor, if it was bombed last night, it was bombed by Israel, which made a joke this morning when asked if they had bombed Iran's nuclear reactor, we never ask a man what he did the night before. Well, let me speculate on what they did the night before. Let me speculate that they flew over or fired a missile over the airspace of Saudi Arabia and or the United Arab Emirates and that it landed on Iran's peaceful nuclear reactor. And it may or it may not have succeeded in destroying it. If it succeeded, there will be even now nuclear radiation in the entire area of Iran in which the reactor was situated. If it failed, one must presume that they will try again. Now, the IAEA is adamant that Iran does not have a nuclear weapon, but nobody doubts that Israel has hundreds of nuclear weapons, all of them undeclared, all of them illegally held, all of them built illegally with the illegal collaboration of countries like the United Kingdom, and the United States of America, we know, thanks to the brave Jewish whistleblower, Mordechai Vanunu, who spent nearly 20 years in solitary confinement for telling us, through the pages of Andrew Neil's Sunday Times, we know that 
30 years ago, Israel had over 200 nuclear weapons, which it doesn't allow anybody to inspect. It will never permit the International Atomic Energy Agency to give it a clean bill of health. How's that for a double standard? Israel can have hundreds of illegal nuclear weapons. Iran gets bombed, bombed. An act of international lawlessness of the kind which led to Nuremberg, which described the making of aggressive war as the ultimate crime. Did you read that in your newspapers this morning? Is it running on the BBC? This is the only place that you will hear and be able to discuss what happened in Iran last night. So if I was running a sweepstake, that would be one of the tickets in the hat for the place where the next war is going to happen. And if it happens, don't imagine for a moment that it will be confined to Israel versus Iran. Every country in between and all of the shipping, naval, military, and aviation assets of everyone that is aligned and allied with Israel will be in the firing line. The Straits of Hormuz will instantly be blocked. At the oil fields of our closest allies, the aforementioned Saudi Arabia among them, will be immediately on fire. You will not be able to buy a barrel of oil at any price. International trade will come to a halt in the Suez Canal. And the mother of all recessions will be immediately triggered. And that's the least dangerous of the theatres of war that I intend to discuss in this monologue. Perhaps the most dangerous is currently unfolding as I speak in the Ukraine. In the Ukraine, after a coup sponsored and organized by the European Union and the United States of America, the elected president was overthrown and driven from the country. The parliament was set on fire and the very first law that the new parliament that succeeded the parliament that was burned down passed was to illegitimize, make illegal the use of the Russian language in the country, which came as something of a shock to the 25% of the Ukrainian population that actually are Russian and speak nothing but Russian in their daily lives. Since when? The borderland between Russia and the Ukraine has become a free territory out with the reach of the coup government in Kiev, buttressed as it is by goose-stepping Nazi fanatics who literally wear swastikas on their armband. That area is called the Donbass. Many of you don't even know that word, don't even know that name, but you may very well hear of little else in the next weeks and months because the next war might be fought over the Donbass. This evening, the Ukrainian government has called on the United States, the United Kingdom, and NATO immediately to send military forces uh, to the part of the Ukraine currently under siege and now being heavily bombarded by the Ukrainian armed forces, namely the Donbass. Now, the eastern Ukraine was the industrial heartland of the Ukraine. Russia doesn't want it, 
but may have to defend the millions of its people whom this evening it has been said by the leader of the Donbass authorities are to be given Russian citizenship. You feeling me? Millions of new Russian citizens being bombed right now by a Ukrainian military that may shortly be reinforced by UK, US and other NATO forces. That sound like a war to you? Well, it does to President Putin, who again this evening has said that the presence of any NATO forces in eastern Ukraine will be a red line for Russia. That sound like a war to you? It certainly does to me. So, dear citizens of the European Union, of the UK and the US, you have to ask yourself this. In this bleak midwinter, when your old age pensioners are shivering and choosing between eating and heating, with your health services crumbling under the pressure of COVID-19 and all of its associated knock-on costs, with your crumbling infrastructures, are you ready to burn untold billions in a war with Russia? Are you ready for your sons, daughters, to die in a war for the Donbass? Ask yourself that question because you may soon have to answer it. And of course, the third potential theater of war remains China. The same China that they're trying across an almost uncountable number of issues, ranging from Tibet to Huawei to Taiwan to the Muslims. The American people really don't like Muslims very much. And they really don't like Chinese people very much. But they really love Chinese Muslims. And they may well be asking you to go to war on one or other or all of these trumped up fake news fabrications, as great as the fabrications that drew us all into the disaster in the war and occupation of Iraq, which hasn't finished yet, whose reverberations are still shaking us, even on the streets of Britain, of Europe, and the United States. People exploding amongst us, ready to explode themselves, to hurt the maximum number of us. All of it fueled by the total disaster of the 2003 invasion and occupation of Iraq. These wars not only don't solve anything, they make everything worse, don't they? Didn't the war and occupation of Afghanistan make every matter worse? Or are you amongst those that thinks the 20 years of blood and treasure we spent in Afghanistan to have been worthwhile? Any of you out there think it was a good idea to overthrow the government of Iraq, to occupy it by hundreds of thousands of foreign soldiers and to send cascading around the world the ISIS ideology. Any of you still think it was a good idea to invade and overthrow Gaddafi in Libya and replace him with the alphabet soup of Islamist fanaticism, some of whom were nurtured here in our own country, in the city of Manchester, which I have just left, and in which I was when one of our hideous monstrosities that we had nurtured deliberately in Manchester, 
blew himself and more than 20 children up in the Manchester arena. Any of you still think that it was a good idea? Any of you still think it was a good idea to become the Air Force and the armorer and the financier and the propagandizer for the Al-Qaeda ISIS hordes in Syria, whose black flag would be flying right now over Damascus if it were not for uh, the aforementioned pantomime villain, President Putin. Any of you still think that was a good idea? I tell you, if I was to choose which of those three, China, Russia, Iran, was the most dangerous theater of war that we may now be standing at the doors of, I would find it difficult to differentiate between them. But here's the nightmare prospect, ladies and gentlemen. What about if a war on any one of them turns into a war against all of them, all at the same time? It's that time of year. Remember Napoleon's march on Moscow? Remember Hitler's attempt to march on Moscow? And remember how it ended. 